Please turn with me, if you would, to the 13th chapter of the book of John. I'd like to read some scriptures here and talk a little bit about the idea of one another. One another. In John 13, beginning at verse 34, picking up the thought in a larger context, our Lord says these things to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now earlier on in the, in the days preceding this, we know this was given just before our Lord was crucified, and he's with his disciples but just a few short days prior to that, he had been asked a question, what is the greatest of all the commandments? You may record, uh, recall that this is in Mark chapter 12 and in Matthew 21, a scribe comes and says, Master, which is the greatest of all the commandments? What's, what's the most important law that we should pay attention to, the law of Moses that had been given to the nation of Israel? And the Lord answers by quoting, and he says that uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind, uh, with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy strength, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says on these two laws, hang all the law and the prophets. That's what God truly requires, love to God and love to our neighbor. And you'll recall that the, the scribe there, who I believe was sincerely interested in the answer, he says, well, Master, you've, you've spoken the truth. For to love God with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might and with all thy strength and to, and to love thy neighbor as thyself is more than all whole uh, burnt offerings and sacrifices, right? In other words, there's an externality to our religion sometimes that God has commanded us to do, but what God is truly interested in is what's going on inside. And those external shows of, of piety, those external acts of service to God don't mean a thing if we're not truly loving him from inside. Notice that here the Lord has elevated it. Not just love your neighbor as yourself, but he says, I want you to love each other the way I loved you. And of course, the love that Jesus Christ has shown is by coming and dying for us, by offering himself uh, upon the cross, bearing the wrath of God to redeem his people and to someday take us home. That's the measure of love. And this, of course, this love that we're to have for one another is for all that we encounter, but especially for those of the household of faith. And that's why Jesus said, I have a new commandment for you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So I, I started thinking about that, that what does it mean to, to love one another? And the scriptures tell us many times, I've, I've found as I've looked in the, uh, um, the New Testament, the writings of Paul and, and John and Peter and others, how many references there are to one another. We're to be kindly affectioned one to another. Okay? We're to have kindness and affection. In honor, we're to prefer one another. We're to receive one another. We're to, in love, admonish one another. That means to correct, to help, but in love. See that? We're to salute one another. And we're to greet one another. He says that several times in different places, right? Greet one another with a holy kiss. That means we're, we're to be glad to be with each other. We're to, we're to express a blessing upon each other when we're together. We're to desire that God would bless you. That's the greeting and the salutations. In Galatians, it says that we're to serve one another, okay? He who would be greatest of all would be servant of all. And we're to be kind one to another, you know, think about how much better the world would be if there was more kindness. Well, this is what the Master has called us to do. We're to forgive one another. We're to forbear one another. We're to teach and admonish one another. We're to comfort one another. We're to edify one another, that is to build up. We're to exhort, which means to encourage. And we're to consider one another. You see, this is, these are all wrapped up in that saying, isn't it? When Jesus says, I want you to love one another as I love you. Doesn't, doesn't the Lord do all of these things for us? And isn't there an expression in the sense in which our service toward Christ really isn't private? 
You know, I've, I've discovered something about myself, uh, uh, things that perhaps are obvious to you all. But let me say this, and I, and I say this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it is true. I have found that it is a whole lot easier for me to be holy when I'm by myself. Okay? It just is. It is. Get up in the morning, and, and I, I try to make it my habit to spend time in prayer, thanking God for the night's sleep. I spend a little bit of time reading the scriptures. I spend some time thinking about the day, meditating. And those, those quiet times, and I hope that you take those also when you wake up in the morning, when you're by yourself, maybe at your coffee, you know, at your, at your kitchen nook or or maybe in your, in your bedroom, when you just have some time, when you're alone, it's with you and the Lord, and you start to think about your day, and you start to think about the problems that you have, and isn't it easy at those times to say, Lord, here's a person in, in my life, and I'm having difficulty with them, but bless them, and help our relationship, show me wisdom, and you know, you can say, here's, a, here's an issue that I'm concerned about, Father, I'm putting that in your hands, I'm just going to, today I'm going to walk and have you guide me and show me, that's what I'm asking for, we all recognize that, right? But then you got to go out the door. <laughs> you got to get in your car and drive down to the office. And if you're like me, about halfway through the morning, you're wondering where that guy went because you've been hit with all sorts of problems. You've been hit with all sorts of issues. But that's what I want you to see is that our Christian faith, hey guys, hi, it's fine. Please sit down. We're glad to have you. You look lovely, huh? Okay. We're talking about the love of God. And how much easier it is to love God when we're by ourselves. But this is, don't you see, that's what the master is calling us to do. Our real love is not just when we're alone. We need those times alone. And that's an important part as well. In your Christian faith, you need to have time alone with God. But you also then have to take it out into the world. And that's where there was a famous general who once said that you can, uh, any battle plan, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. You know, you, you, you can plan all you want. You can say, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to do these things. But then the rubber hits the road. And that's where the challenges to our faith come. I said all of that for this reason. I'd like to speak, take just a few minutes and talk about the life of Jacob. Remember Jacob. Jacob is the one who was the father of Israel. In fact, God named him Israel, Prince of God. He was the father of all the 12 tribes of Israel. It's interesting when you look at the book of, of Genesis, how that, that whole book is about four generations. You know, the first 11 chapters tell us a great deal about how the world was created and the fall and the flood and all these things. But then from that point forward, from about chapter 12 in Genesis all the way to chapter 50, God gives us a great deal of information about four successive generations. The generation of, of Abraham and all of his adventures, all the things that he learned, all the promises that God made. And then his son Isaac, there's not as much about him, but there is in there about Isaac and his, his problems, his issues. And then we have a lot about Jacob, whom we're going to talk about. And then his sons, primarily Joseph. So you can see there's four generations. And you know what's interesting is these things took place like 4,000 years ago. And yet as you look at their lives and the difficulties that they faced and the, and the, the failures of their faith and, and the problems and the strife, both with their family, both within and without, it's very, very familiar to us. The same God who kept these men will keep you. And that's the lesson that we need to learn. So I'd like to begin, and I won't take long, but I would like to take you through some of the events that are recorded for us in the book of Genesis about this man, Jacob. And the place I'd like to begin is, is in Genesis 48. I'll have to give you a little bit of background. Those of you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the story, but God called Abram, Abraham initially, right? And, and ha had him go and, and God took him and promised him and blessed him. And ultimately, the promises of Abraham are the fact that his seed, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, would come through him, right? Through, his, and through him and his seed would all the nations of the earth be blessed. And that's how that has ultimately come. That's a messianic promise of Jesus Christ. After Abraham was Isaac, his son. And Isaac had two sons by his wife, Jacob and Esau. And God chose, he elected Jacob, not because of their merit or anything, but because that's how God does things. He, by his sovereign will, by his sovereign mercy, he showed favor 
to Jacob. Well, Jacob is now late in life. As you know the story, his, his sons uh, were jealous of his son Joseph, and Joseph was uh, sold into slavery. He went to Egypt, but God, by a mighty hand, raised him up to bring deliverance to the nation of, of Egypt, and indeed the whole world in a time of great famine. The nation was, uh, the, the family was reunited, and in Genesis 48 now, I'm obviously fast-forwarding to the end of Jacob's life. He's an old man. But I want you to see what his view on his life. Jo Joseph hears that his father Jacob is sick, and so he brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, who were adopted by Jacob. They become two of the 12 tribes, and he blesses them. But then he says something about how that God had blessed himself. This is what Jacob had learned late in his life. It says, and he that is Jacob, this is in Genesis 48, verse 15. It says, and he that is Jacob blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, that is his grandchildren that he is adopting. And let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. We often talk about Manasseh and Ephraim, how that Ephraim was the younger, but he received the, the, the double portion. He decided the blessing God, how God chose the younger rather than the elder, just as he had chosen Jacob, who was the younger of the twins. But I want you to focus on those three things that... Jacob is saying, he's saying it to his son, Joseph, and he's saying this to his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh. God, the God of my fathers, the God who was faithful to my grandfather, Abraham, and the God who was faithful to my father, Isaac, that God, the one who blesses us, who has promised us, and he doesn't break his promises. He has promised blessing to his people, okay? He is blessed, so he's recognizing that. And notice he says, the God which fed me my lifelong day. Do you realize that God is the one who feeds you? He's the one who provides for you. You might say, no, I go to work. Yeah, who gave you that job? Okay, you might say, yes, but I'm the one who saved the money. Who's the one who enabled you to have those things? All we have is from God, and God is gracious to us. Now, God doesn't just intend to give us natural blessings to provide for us. He knows we need that. His desire is to give us spiritual blessings, to learn to trust Him, to learn to look to Him, to look to Him the way Jacob did. He's looking back on his whole life, and Jacob had a tough life. I mean, I'm not going to paint a, a rosy picture and tell you that it was easy for him. It wasn't, because that's the third thing he says. Jacob says, and the angel, that is the messenger. That was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, in my view. Okay? But God himself came and appeared to Jacob multiple times and made wondrous promises to him. But notice what he said, the angel which kept me from all evil. Now in the Bible, the word evil sometimes means wickedness. And that's what we normally think when we hear the word evil. And certainly that is true. But in the Bible, the word evil can also mean misfortune. It can also mean difficulty. It can mean a time of trial. And it's really the same thing because it all stems from the same cause. The original sin of Adam, our parents Adam and Eve, which brought evil into the world. And yet notice what Jacob says, God has saved me from all the evil that I encountered in my life. Now let's, let's talk about that. Again, not to take a lot of time, but if you'll begin reading about Genesis 28 or so and read all the way through the end of the book of, of, of Genesis, you'll get a sense of the kind of difficulties, the kind of evil that Jacob encountered. And you know what? Some of this he brought on himself. Okay. Now, I love all of you, okay? even those of you who I've just met. But the same thing is true today. Sometimes the difficulties and the trials and the troubles and the problems, and yes, the evils that, account, that you encounter, some of them 
you bring up on yourself too. Okay, But you can learn from them. God will forgive you and you move on. But I'm here to tell you that likewise, some of them, you don't. So when we look at the evils and the difficulties that Jacob went through, he didn't bring all of them on himself. But what you will see as you look at the life of Jacob, as he experienced these things, his faith grew. He knew more about God. He knew more about who this was who had his life and the life of his father and the life of his grandfather in his hand. He knew that. Let's, let's think about this. And again, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to just throw out some things that, uh, that, um, that, that Jacob encountered, some of the stories concerning Jacob. We know that when his mother, Rebekah, was carrying uh, Jacob and Esau, she was pregnant. Um, her, his father, Isaac, had entreated the Lord, asked the Lord, because they were not able to have a child. But after 20 years, then God blessed them. And, but she noticed that she was carrying twins, that there was a great deal of agitation in her womb. I mean, children, I, I, you know, I, I've talked to women who have born uh, twins, and it's hard enough having one kid in there. You know, two of them fighting with each other is tough. But this must have been an extraordinary amount of strife. And God told her that that's because there are two types of people in your womb, two nations, two heads of nations, the nation of the world represented by Esau, natural man and spiritual man. Jacob, okay? And he says, one shall be stronger than the other. I think that's a reference to Esau. In some sense, he's more strong. He had the advantages in the world. But he says, the elder shall serve the younger, okay? And we know that as they grew up, there was a great deal of strife. Uh, the blessing, uh, the blessings of the firstborn were to go to uh, Jacob, but I think Isaac didn't want to do that. Isaac favored his son Esau. Esau was a man of the field. He was a man who was wild, and, and he enjoyed the outdoors. He was a, 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 a man who, who loved to hunt and, and to wander. And it says that Jacob, by contrast, was a plain man. That doesn't mean he was a weak man, but it means that he was a quiet man. You may have known people like that, that one is really loud and boisterous. You know, maybe you, maybe you know someone like that that's loud and boisterous and, 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 and full of, of, of that kind of activity. And then maybe you know somebody else who's really quiet. And, and just kind of meditative. And, and that, this is the contrast between these two brothers. Well, we find a time whenever Jacob uh, is, is at home and he's making some pottage, some, some uh, stew, and his brother comes in and he's hungry. And instead of giving his brother some food, which he should have done, he sells it to him. Okay, you see, you see the dysfunction in this family? Yeah, there's four generations of dysfunction in this, in this family. And there's dysfunction in your life. This is, this is sin. This is what we have to deal with. We look to Jesus Christ to help us. And, and there's, but there's obviously some serious problems going on. Esau despised his birthright, so he sold it to his brother. Then you know the story later on that um, where Rebekah and Jacob fool. They lie. They lie to Isaac. Isaac is old and he's uh, unable to see. And to, to steal the blessing, he pretends to be his brother. He puts on his clothes. They put skins on his hand. Obviously, this is wrong. But they did that, and, and he received the blessing. He then had to run away because his brother wanted to kill him. Remember, Jacob's saying, all the evils, all the troubles, all the problems that I've had in my life. Esau says, as soon as dad's dead, I'm killing you. Okay? And so they said, go, go live in the, the land of Pandamaram. Go, go live with your uncle. Stay there for a while till I call for you. Everything's going to be safe. And Esau calms down. And you know the, the, the issues that Jacob had there, even though God blessed him, God appeared to him, right, and said that go and I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. This is, you know, uh, this is a, a, wondrous, a wondrous vision. There are several times that God appeared to Jacob. But my point is, is I want you to see how many problems and difficulties and troubles that Jacob had. His, his difficulties weren't when he was alone. It was when he was in encountering the people in his life. And Laban, his father-in-law, tricked him the same way he was. You know, he had Leah and Rachel. Um, as, as he labored for his, for his father-in-law, his father-in-law changed his wages 10 times. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like in your life that people are taking advantage of you? And not, Guess what? You're not alone. Guess who's going to see you through that? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, because it's the same Lord and the same blessings and the same promises are there. That's not all that happened to, to Jacob, though. 
Because if we, we read over in chapter 32 that God appears to, to Jacob and says, it's time for you to return. And so he runs away. He, he scampers off with his family. No doubt he's afraid of Laban, but God resolves that. But now he's, he's afraid of his brother Esau. And that's a, these are real problems. You can see these are real issues. And notice what he does. What has Jacob learned in the 20 years of the difficulties that he's gone through? He's learned to trust God. In Genesis 32, we find for us recorded, I believe, the first prayer that's in the Bible, where Jacob pours out his heart to God. In verse 9 of chapter 32, it says, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto my servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. In other words, he had so many flocks and so many family, So many children that he literally had to divide his possessions into two bands. Of course, one of the reasons he did that was he was afraid that that Esau, who was going to come and murder him, was going to kill everybody. He said, maybe one of us, some of us can survive. Jacob, though, is recognizing in this quiet place, just him and the Lord, this quiet place, he's pouring out his heart to God. And that's what all of God's people are to do. We must have that time where we go to God and we pour out our heart to him and we tell him both what we're afraid of and we recognize the blessings and we, to the best we can, we trust him. We pour out our faith to him. And notice what he's saying. He says, I'm in trouble, God. I, my, my brother Esau, I am afraid. Notice what he says. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. You see, one of the greatest privileges we have as children of God is to go to our Father and to tell Him how we really feel. Okay, We put on a strong face. We put on a good show for one another. But we've got to be honest with ourselves and we've got to be honest with God. And you know what? He will deliver you in His way, in His time. And he will teach you a lesson. He will increase your faith by what you go through. I'm not saying it's going to be fun. I'm not going to say it's easy. And I'm not saying it's going to be the way that you want it done. But you're going to learn to trust him. You're going to learn to trust him just as Jacob did here. I fear my my brother. And I'm afraid that he's going to come and kill us all. He's going to come kill me. He's going to come kill my children. He's going to kill the the, the, because of the great anger that he has. You know, God. How, how wicked a man he is. And yet, think about how the story goes. God gave Jacob the wisdom to solve this problem. Do you remember the story? It's actually kind of charming. He begins to realize that his brother is hot-headed, and so what he does is he separates no less than nine separate little flocks of animals. Okay? He has enough servants, and he, he sends them on. He sends some, some lambs, and he sends... Uh, you know, some goats, and he sends some camels and some, some, some donkeys and other, other livestock. And he says, I want you to separate yourself out because I know that, that uh, Esau is riding down with his men, and I want you to slow him down. <laughs> and I want you to show up and tell him that your servant, Jacob, is right behind us, and this is a present for you. And notice how that God enabled Jacob to, to, to soothe the wrath of his brother, right? Uh, Solomon wrote that a, 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 a soft answer turns away wrath. For grievous words stir up anger, right? So instead of confronting him, and instead of trying to get in there and, and, and work it out, he, he appeased him by this. And, and no doubt, after a while, it got kind of ridiculous how many uh, animals that, that Esau and, and his uh, his, his, his men had to handle, oh, I guess we'll put those over there, you know? And finally, Jacob did appear, and he bowed himself to the ground, and they were reconciled. The God of heaven can reconcile any relationship that you have in this world, but he is the one who does it. You can't work it out. There's another proverb that Solomon tells us. This is in Proverbs 16 and 7, where he says, when a man's ways please the Lord, 
He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Think about the context of that. When a man's ways please the Lord, we please the Lord when we're by himself, when we're by ourselves, and when we're with one another. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there is some obedience involved in this. But if you will please the Lord, if you will work on your relationship with the Lord, he has the power and is willing to make every other relationship in your life better. And here's an example. They were never best buds. They still lived apart. They were still separate men, but they were able to live peaceably one with another because of what God did them. And I want you to see that. That that is what we're seeing when we say to have love one for another, to be kind one to another, to salute one another, to show honor one to another. This is where our faith meets the road. This is where we practice our Christianity. Okay? But it's not a fake one. It's a genuine one. And that's, these are the kinds of things that, that uh, Jacob went through. You might think, oh, great, I'm glad that's over. And many times in your life, you may have a difficulty where you're facing something that is very hard, and you can say, oh, thank God, you, it, it's over. Okay? Yeah, I'm glad that's done. God has reconciled it. Uh, that season of testing, that season of sorrow, that season of evil is gone. Guess what? There's another one coming. There's another one coming. And you got to say, all right, Lord, show me, show me what you want to teach me next. Let your will be done. Show me how to behave. Give me wisdom and give me a kind heart. And if there's somebody that I'm dealing with, you see, you see how God is able to purify us. He's a refiner, right? And that's how he refines our faith by dealing with one another. Like I said, when I'm by myself, it's easy for me to get along with everybody. I get along with you all splendidly when I'm not with you. <laughs> okay. It's when I'm with you that I get on your nerves. <laughs> okay. Right? And, that's, and look at this couple over here. They're going to, they are so much in love, right? And they are so excited about being married. And it's going to be hard, <laughs> but it's also going to be a great joy. Okay. Because we follow what the master told us. There's many more things that happened in Jacob's life, right? After he had been re reconciled with Esau, you'd think, okay, they, everything's great. But he loses his wife. He loses Rachel. That's a great, awful thing, right? They camp outside this city of Shechem, and Levi and Simeon go in and murder everybody, right? I mean, that's a real problem, okay? That's a, that's a horrible thing. His brothers, out of jealousy, and maybe Jacob wasn't showing the greatest wisdom by showing such favoritism to his favorite son, Joseph, but they fake his death, right, and sell him into slavery. He has to spend the next 20-some-odd years thinking that his son is dead. I mean, he's gone through some serious problems. He's gone through some serious difficulties. You will, too. But there's also joy. There's also sweetness. You know, when, when, when Jacob was reunited with his son, he says, it's enough. Okay, it's enough. And that's what you're going to learn to do also. also. The little things that God gives us, a, a wedding, the birth of a child, you know, some, some new event. These are the things that God gives us also that are from his hand. And we appreciate them a whole lot more against the backdrop of, of the difficulties that he's shown himself. He, God shows his goodness do everything that he does. And this is, this is what the Bible tells us from the very beginning. The first four family, first four generations we learn about, not counting the ones that are, of course, recorded uh, in the first 11 chapters. But these first in-depth details show us what life really is. And it's showing us the promise of the gospel. Because all of this grace and mercy and love comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to, there's one more place I want to go. There's a lot more that you could uh, to read, but the last place I want to go is, is in Genesis 47. And the reason I want to go here is, is because, likewise, this is towards the end of, of uh, excuse me, towards the end of uh, Jacob's life. He's been reunited with Joseph. As you recall, Joseph has been made the prime minister of all of Egypt and brought the family safely, just as God said that would happen. But he brings in Jacob before Pharaoh. When, when you think about Egypt, we sometimes think that, well, that's a wicked nation. Well, not always. Not in these days. God blessed Egypt just like he did bless others. And he will pull his people out of every nation in the world. But in closing, I just want to go to Genesis 47 and begin at verse 7. It says, And Joseph brought in Jacob his father, 
and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and I have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. Now, if you, you see that Jacob lived another 17 years. He was 130 years now, but he did die when he was 147. His grandfather, Abraham, lived to be 175. His father, Isaac, made it to 180. He's saying that it's short. But notice what he says. Few and short and evil have been the days of my life. He's not bitter. He's just saying, I have had a rough life. I have seen a lot of things. But notice what he's doing. He's blessing Pharaoh and he's blessing his children. He's a blessing to all around them because he's learned the lesson that we're to learn. I began this talk by showing you that Jesus has said, I want you to love one another the way I have loved you. And this is how people will know you're my disciples. People knew Jacob was a follower of God. They knew it by his life. And as we spend time on this life, whether we're young or old, I hope that as we grow older, we too likewise will understand that even if our lives are full of evil and trouble and problems, we will trust God. And we will look to him and we know that he is the one who will feed us every day. And he is the one who will deliver us from all of the evil that we see. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. He's coming soon. I thank you for your very kind attention. May God bless you.